so, hour and a half is the goal. No. Let's pray. Lord, I know we've just been at your throne and at your cross in worship and in prayer, but Lord, I also I just want to lift up my voice right now and ask that you would speak to us, Lord, that your, your message, your power, your spirit would be here, Father, and that this would be a, a holy place, a sanctified place, because you are here and you are speaking to us, Lord. We dedicate our hearts to you, and may every word spoken come from your throne room. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We don't use the word Advent very much anymore today. It is an older style word. Um, we built it into our identification as a, as a church, as Seventh-day Adventists. Um, but we don't really uh, use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, as a matter of fact, when we became Seventh-day Adventists, uh, some of our friends and family uh, thought that was, they'd never really heard of that before, and they said, what, you're, you're Christmas Christians now? Um, because in, for most people, the only context where they really think of Advent is the Christmas Advent calendar, and they, they had just reasoned that Advent must mean Christmas, and in a way it does. It means coming, uh, so every Christmas we celebrate the first coming of Jesus Christ, um, if you're into history and things like that, you might be familiar with the word Advent when people say things like, well, before the advent of the automobile, people still ro rode in horses and buggies and things like that, before the coming. Or they, they might even say before the advent of Augustus Caesar, Rome was a republic, but after C Augustus came, it became an empire and things like that. But like so many other words in Christianity, uh, we don't always make connections with them. Uh, what is a Presbyterian anyways? What is an Episcopalian? Uh, a Lutheran is named after Luther. That's fine. But what does that mean? Baptist, at least it has the idea of baptism in it. But as Adventists, it has a meaning for us as well. We are dedicated to the preparation and proclamation of the coming of Jesus Christ. It is in our name. We are Seventh-day Adventists, and those two core ideas give a definition to the DNA of our faith, and we believe that God has established these two things as core realities of God's people in the last days. I want to talk about the Advent today. Now, again, we are a little bit uh, of a different service because the kids aren't here. I normally begin my services with a kid's quiz, but most of our kids are in children's church, so I switch it to teen trivia. Now, I know all the teens just got done with school, and they're like, the last thing I want to do is to be tested again. Don't worry, we'll make it easy on you. But I would like to interact with the young people just a little bit in the beginning of my service, as is my tradition. Uh, Mr. Tomas, does this mic work? And, and uh, thank you, Nassim. For the benefit of everyone to be able to hear, and we'll let this be uh, for, for others as well, but uh, let's just talk about the advent of Jesus a little bit. What will you hear when Jesus comes again? Think of any of the Bible stories or Bible verses that talk about the coming of Jesus and anything related to what you might hear. Ryden, I knew, I saw him. I'm like, Ryden's my man. He's got it. Ryden, what do you have to say? Trumpets. Ah, one of the major elements of the second coming is referenced throughout Scripture is the trumpet. The last trump shall sound, and so the sound of a trumpet. But there's other sounds. There's other sounds there, church family. Any of you young people, can you think of other sounds that are specifically connected to the second coming of Jesus? Let's just tick off a couple real quick. And we can have help from others as well because... This might be in an hour and a half service if we don't <laughs> move along here. Anyone? What other sounds? Boy, I'm putting you on the spot. Neil, I know you're thinking of one right now. I can see it. You're like, I got it. Neil's got it right here, Nassim. He just decided all on his own. I didn't have to prod him or anything. He just was ready to go. Neil. <laughs> There's a text that says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Okay, you will hear, all right, that's, uh, yeah, kind of the, some of the birth pangs of the coming of, of Jesus Christ, yes. 
well, I didn't think it would be so tricky. Uh, it's a good thing we're talking about the Advent today because it sounds like there's some things we need to be reminded about. All right, Vanessa, and then we'll go to the next one. Uh, shouts and sh- shouts and the earthquake. The okay, earthquake. all right. Well, you're, you mentioned several of them, so let's just look at them real quick, all right? Yes, there's the, the, the Bible talks about a great roar or a shout or the voice of God reverberating throughout the heavens, okay? So all these things. Yes, there's earth events, the convulsions of the earth, the rending of the rocks, the sky rolling up like a scroll. I, you think we're going to hear those things? Okay. Um, the, the loudest natural sound in the world is a volcano. I don't know if you knew that. The explosion of a volcano creates the loudest sound in, in, in nature, okay? A trumpet is the loudest sound a human being can make without electronic amplification or something like that, okay? A horn or a trumpet blast. You cannot amplify, you know, without electronics, anything greater than a trumpet. So these are loud sounds. Also, music Did you know throughout Scripture, music is associated with the second coming of Christ? You've heard of the Song of the Redeemed, haven't you? Okay? The world was created in music. Okay? God used music when He created the world, and all the sons of God shouted with joy, and the stars sang together when God created. So will redemption be done in music. So there's going to be song. The Bible talks about harps being played. The the Bible talks about a great song, the song of the redeemed, the song of Moses and of the Lamb, and many other things. The the second coming of Christ is going to be an enormously loud event with many things happening. For the Lord Himself will descend. This is one that mentions several of them. He's going to descend with a shout, right? Not a whisper. He's going to descend with a great shout victorious shout with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise for us. This is a shout so loud that even the dead hear. This is the advent when Jesus Christ comes again. And it goes on to say in Isaiah, break forth together into singing. You place, you waste places of Jerusalem. Very similar to when Jesus on the, uh, uh, on the triumphal entry, when everyone said, it's being too loud, Jesus, you need to keep it quiet. And he says, if these children remain quiet, even the very rocks will cry out. You remember that verse? All right. Here in Isaiah, it says a similar thing about the coming of Christ, that even the desert places are going to be singing at his return. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. All the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of of our God. That's the next question. What will you see when Jesus comes again? I mean, I gave some helps on this one. Where will we see Jesus when He returns? Is He going to come and sit on the front pew? And He's going to stand up and turn around and say, hey, everyone, I'm Jesus. Is that where we expect to see Jesus? AB's got one to help us out here. In the sky. Oh, thank you very much. And, and uh, Evangelist Lyle Albrecht like to say, the three words that will save us from Antichrist, in the air. Jesus says we will see Him come in the clouds. When Jesus ascended into heaven in the book of Acts, the angels said, this same Jesus who, who left will return in the same way that you've seen Him go. So when we see Jesus again, He's not going to be walking around on earth wearing a suit and tie or preaching from pulpits and saying, hey, hello, everybody, I'm the Lord, I'm Jesus, I'm the Messiah. The next time we see Jesus, He's going to be in the air. He's going to be in the clouds of heaven. That's where we will see Jesus next. Who will be with Jesus when He returns? Is He just going to be alone? Just one guy floating around in the sky? Or is there going to be anybody with Him? Uh, Let's give the young... Mr. Lucas from uh, British Columbia, you are new. So we will allow this indiscretion. I'm just kidding. We were playing together a little bit in Sabbath school. So I I hope you understand. Uh, Some of the young people first. And then we'll let Lucas have a chance. Some of the young people. Who's going to be with Jesus? It's going to be a one-man show, or is there someone going to be with him? Oh, see, Raiden, he's helping me out over here. You might just want to hang in this vicinity. This side over here, they're kind of sleeping. They're, they're sleeping. We're going to, no, I'm just playing. Oh, we lost sound, Mr. Tomas. Did we? Sound check. Oh, thank you. The angels? The an- How many of them? Five, six, 11? 910? 910! Revelation says 910. No. No. The Bible says all the angels. How many angels are there? I think there's more than 910. 
How many angels are there? There's a lot of them. Multitude, more than can be numbered. And the Bible says all the holy angels are going to be with Jesus. Now, are, are angels re relatively visible beings when they appear? Do people usually notice when they see an angel? And I don't mean this in a super, uh, spiritual way. Most of the time in the Bible when an angel is revealed, that one angel is so powerful that people shake in fear. At the resurrection of Jesus, remember one angel comes and he opens the tomb. What happened to the Roman soldiers? They fell down dead. Well, they fell down like they had died. Okay, so one angel is in a glorious revelation. How many will a billion, billion angels look like when they're with Jesus? And also, Jesus is not coming alone. The other members of the Godhead will be there. The Holy Spirit and the Father is coming with Him as well. What about the dead? What will you see when Jesus comes again? What will you see in connection with the dead? I'm not trying to be tricky here. I want you to think about these things. Come on, a little help here. We're almost there. Yeah, A.B., go ahead. Um, the dead will rise again. See, this is not hard. A.B. got it figured out. We're going to see resurrections. Now, what is that going to look like? What is it going to look like to see resurrections? I don't know, Vince, but I know we're going to see it, and it's going to be amazing. What is happening on the earth? We're just going to skip this one because we kind of talked about it when we heard. Disasters. We're going to see these things happening and much more. Okay, last question. Oh, the verses go along. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky. And the Bible makes this statement in many places with power and great glory. I love that addition of the word great. It wasn't good enough just to say glory. He said with great glory right? Like in Revelation 15 where it says, great and marvelous are your works. It wasn't enough just to say marvelous are your works. Great and marvelous are your works. What is that great glory going to look like? I don't know, but it's going to be great. Last one. Now, this one is going to be, uh, uh, again, kind of open. What will you feel both emotionally and physically? Think about this now. When Jesus comes again, what will you feel? And, and, and just, it, uh, I know this is partly just your imagination or based upon what you, you know from Scripture, but what will you be feeling at that moment? Anybody? You're just so hard to pick on the pastor here. Joy. Vanessa. Joy, that's a good one. How many of you are, are going to be happy when Jesus comes? That's okay to say. Yeah. Anyone else? What will you feel when Jesus comes again? Think physically. What will you physically feel? All right, way back. Are you raising your hand? Are you stretching? All right, I want to get it on the, the magnification here. We got to hear this. This is powerful stuff. Relief. Relief. You mean physically? She said yes. You, you know that when Jesus comes again, we are going to be changed, the Bible says. What is that change going to feel like? Is it going to feel like relief? What will it be like to be transformed in that moment? Okay, I, I, I realize these are some kind of, a, kind of a, ethereal questions, and I'm not trying to trick anyone. Here's just some, some th things that might come to mind. All of these things, and depending on who you are, depending on what context it is, some of these things might come to mind. You want to know the number one thing that I hear from people when we talk about the second coming, what they're going to feel? Scared. Even believers, I'll, I'll talk and they'll say, that, I'm, I, it's going to be a scary thing when Jesus comes. And there's an idea of all that you think about these things, the shout and the earthquakes and the volcanoes. There, it's okay to say that's kind of a scary thought, even though you have the promise of redemption, even though you have the promise of salvation, this whole context of all the earth convulsing and the shout and all these things and the resurrections, there's a level of, of fear that is associated with that. But the one that really gets me excited, oh, and it kind of uh, threw the G underneath there, the healing that will take place. Any of you have any aches and pains? You have allergies, a little congestion? Have any, any uh, joints a little out of whack? What will it feel like in that moment? Behold, I tell you a mystery. Thank you, Nassim, and thank you for indulging the little time of 
interaction trivia. I tell you a mystery, we'll not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed at the advent of Jesus Christ. The people of God will sing a song of joy, like the songs at the holy festivals. You will be filled with joy. It's when a flutist leads a group of pilgrims to Jerusalem, the mountains of the Lord to the rock of Israel. And the Lord will make His majestic voice heard. He will display the strength of His mighty arm. It will descend with devouring flames and cloudbursts, thunderstorms and huge hailstorms. No one's going to miss this event. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since the time there was a nation. And at that time, your people, everyone found written in the book, will be saved. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting, li everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly. I like this passage. Those who have insight, those who understand, those who are following the prophecies of Daniel, those who understand what God is doing, they are going to shine brightly. You know, we believe that at creation, when Adam and Eve were first made, though they were naked, they were shining. They were glowing with the glory of God. They were veiled in God's glory. They were shining. A glow that was lost when sin came in the world. That shine and that resilience and that resilience is going to be restored to us at the time of our redemption. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of the heaven. Those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning, peals, sounds, and peals of thunder. There was a great earthquake such as there's not been since man came upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. Now, little children, abide in Him, so that when He appears, we may have confidence and may not shrink away from Him in shame at His coming. It's late, the day is over. The sky is dark, darker than usual. The sun has set, but the moon is not visible. And even the stars are faint and give little light. It must be about 11 o'clock and you're tired and ready for sleep. After a long day, you finally take off your shoes and lay on the bed. And as you put your head to your pillow, your mind is flooded with thoughts of the past few days and weeks and months. How quickly Things have changed. Very few things make sense anymore. You're convinced that the Lord is coming soon. Yes, He's coming very soon. Not everyone feels this way, though. As a matter of fact, you sometimes feel alone in your convictions. Often mocked for your faith, even by so-called friends, you have tried to talk openly about the Lord's coming, but few respond. Neighbors, friends, even some family members seem numb to the losses of freedoms, happiness, and basic values once enjoyed. A simple thing, such as buying a loaf of bread or a gallon of gas, has become a constant struggle. Most basic resources are rationed, or they require special permission to acquire. You and a small group of others have survived by working together, and miraculously, you have never been in want for your basic needs. Just last week, a total stranger showed up and gave you a bag of food and some other much-needed items. This has almost become a regular occurrence, but still it's not easy. Every day is a struggle, and many have given up their faith and abandoned God. But then there are others, new friends and believers who have joined the struggle. They, too, were unwilling to join the state-sponsored society that regulates the markets and has openly mocked and targeted those who are still worshiping according to the Bible. What has become of us all? When will this end? You think to yourself as you lie in bed. How long, O Lord, until your salvation is revealed? And then there are all the false teachers, the false messiahs that were becoming popular. People flocked to hear them. They claimed to be representatives of God. Even some called themselves God, Christ incarnate, but you knew better. These people sounded very convincing, and they even had strange powers, but they did not teach the Bible as you knew it. They were imposters, and it grieved you to see how many were led astray by them. Another riot erupted in town recently. Looting was common. You were not there, but you heard that your old church had been vandalized again. It little mattered. You'd not worshiped there for months, 
It was abandoned and boarded up back when all churches and religious institutions were ordered to comply with the new religious rules and regulations. Your church had refused, but a few weeks later it was ordered to close and disband. Many members were angry with the church. They thought the new rules were fine and would keep peace in the community. Some of them moved on and joined other churches that did comply with the rules. And they all worshipped on Sunday while they were allowed and enjoyed wide support from the community and even some in government. Even some former church leaders were among them, but others refused and formed house churches and small groups, but some of these had been broken up too. People were betraying one another, and it was just terrible how some had become so bitter and violent. And no one had seen the pastor for months. Now, there were rumors, but no one knew for sure what had happened to him. You and about 20 others had been meeting in homes, but tried to keep it quiet. These were powerful prayer meetings and times of study and encouragement. You'd even seen miracles during these times, true miracles, healings, visions, various signs were taking place. All who were there were confident that God was working among them. A great battle was being waged in the minds and hearts of those who were on earth. Truly, Christ's return must be soon. Then, just yesterday, a frightening and terrible thing happened. You were with a small group of worshipers when you heard a loud roar, almost as if a jet plane had flown right over your head. Everyone looked up, and there you saw it with your own eyes. The sun, the moon, the evening stars were trembling, physically quaking in the sky. The very powers of the heaven were shaking with it, and a great noise accompanied it. It lasted only for a moment, but it was extremely alarming. Immediately, the news agencies put out notices that this was just a celestial event and, and not to be uh, taken uh, seriously. Not long ago, it had been like the sun had never risen. It was there for all in, in the sky for all to see, but almost no light came from it, and the moon could reflect no light either. For 24 hours, the earth was bathed in almost total darkness. Again, the scientists claimed this was just an unusual solar event. Don't worry. They told everyone to expect more cosmic and solar happenings. And these were all the results of solar winds and atmospheric interference. But you had seen something different. Others claimed that these signs were evidence of God's approval for their new church and mandates. The heavens themselves, they declared, give approval of our day of worship. The sun itself bows in deference to the will of the one who has declared the holy day of worship and fellowship. You knew better, however. God had said in His word, I am the Lord, I do not change. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. And the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter nor stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. And Jesus had said, if you love me, keep my commandments. These were your thoughts as you lay in your bed and you drift to sleep with a silent prayer and appeal to God. When will you come? What is left to be done? Suddenly you find yourself awake, staring at the ceiling. Or are you still asleep? Your senses are tense and you feel an odd sensation come over you. How long have I been asleep? What time is it? You look for a clock, but you notice that, it is, that the power has gone out and there are no lights or clocks working. And yet there is a strange light that seems to be peeking into your covered windows. But it's unlike any light you've ever seen. Is it morning? It can't be. It must only be about midnight, you guess, but what is that light? Has the moon finally broken through the dark clouds? Sleep and weariness vanish from you, and you now find yourself inextricably drawn to your front door, and you step out into the street to see what the strange scene is. Clearly, it's still night, but a gray, pale light seems to be illuminating the sky, and you're struck by the stillness of the air, the silence of the night. No breeze is blowing, no cricket chirps. There's no sound whatsoever. It's absolutely silent. It's neither eerie nor calming, neither depressing nor comforting, not too unlike the stillness before the storm, yet deeper and much more intense. It's simply unnatural and beyond explanation. Neighbors now and strangers join you in the street. Every house is emptied, yet no one speaks or breaks the silence. For as soon as your mind attempts to comprehend the scenes around you, your eyes and senses are drawn to the eastern sky. At first, it looks like the sun was about to rise, but this is unlike any sunrise ever witnessed. A bright, streaking light 
far on the horizon is rising. Like an arrow point, it ascends. And behind this light, a great company of stars and lights and bright objects follow. A mighty cloud of followers. It's almost an inst- in, in almost an instant, the entire eastern sky is ablaze with glorious light and dazzling brilliance. Your heart jumps in your chest as your mind slowly begins to comprehend what you're seeing. The light is growing nearer with incredible speed and power. And then you hear it. Very faint at first, yet it's unmistakable. Breaking the stillness, the silence of the air is the resonating, shrill, long, piercing blast of a single trumpet note. The note hangs in the air with unending strength and vigor. As the light draws near, the blast intensifies in its strength and tone until it becomes a deafening roar above the clouds. Its deep resonance washes over you like peeling thunder. It reverberates until the very ground shakes. At first, you're tempted to throw your hands over your ears to protect your hearing, but you find that the power of the blast is not painful or upsetting. You stand transfixed as your body and soul are filled with wonder and amazement at this sight and the sound. And then comes the wind. A great, mighty, hot wind sweeps through the valleys and streets, crashes through every tree and house. Your face is brushed in the hot gust. But again, you're not overcome or dazed. The wind is blowing. The trumpet echo continues. And now you see what you've been longing to see for so long. The light is now near. The arrow point is visible. It is no mistake. It is no dream. You see him clearly and you know him. Though you have never seen His form, you know it is Him. You see mercy in His face. You see majesty in His eyes. It is the Lord Jesus Christ come again. He's flying in the heavens, head held high, trumpet in one hand, scepter in the other, crowned in righteous glory, magnificent in power. Beneath Him, behind Him, all around Him are beings of such glorious light and beauty. You're shocked that your very eyes can perceive them. Colors that you've never seen before flash forth from their wings, and they carry with them swords and great golden harps from which they strike deep notes of melody." There are thousands of them, millions, more than any man could count. Like an undulating cloud of light and air, they follow their master in his conquest over the earth. Above Christ is a huge and splendid dove, wings unfurled, glistening in light. You know that this is the Holy Spirit, and his presence speaks peace. And at Christ's left side is the great and magnificent throne, flying in the air with Christ. But the throne is awash in such brilliance and light, no form or feature is visible. Your heart jumps again as you realize this is none other but the Father, as Jesus had told the high priest on the day of his crucifixion. Hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Christ is still miles away from where you stand, yet your eyes are sharpened and and astonishingly perceptive as this scene becomes clear to you. As the procession draws closer, the trumpet blast subsides, subsides and a new sound bursts upon the earth. There is a shout, a great and glorious shout erupts from the leaps, from the lips of Christ, a deep and grave shout. His voice is lifted up. Every ear is filled with his words, like the sounds of the multitude, like many waters, his words thunder across the earth. The ground shakes again. The rocks split as they surrender to its might. It's a shout of authority. It's a shout of power. It commands and the winds and the rocks rocks respond. His words flow out saying, behold, I have overcome the world. I am the resurrection and the life. The curse is no more. Death is swallowed up in victory. Awake you who sleep in the dust and arise. Come, you blessed of my Father. Inherit your kingdom. Salvation belongs to the Lord. On the heels of His words, the songs of the angels could be heard singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and the whole earth is filled with His glory. Jesus' words are commands. They are the very words of life filled with power and with purpose. The earth quakes. The tombs and the graves break open, and like bolts of light, resurrected saints rush from their sleeping gu- graves and are guided by angels to the side of Jesus. They join the procession in the song. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and magnify your name? For you alone are holy, and all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. 
with the resurrected saints, the living redeemed, start to rise in their translation as well. In that joyous moment, families are reunited. Parents receive back their children. Spouses embrace once more. Friends unite together again, and all are transformed in new bodies and new minds. No wrinkles, no pains or sickness, no disorder, disease, or debility is found in them anymore. Such a glad and happy moment is beyond powers of description. But not all is glad at this moment. As the glorious parade draws ever closer to you, you look beyond and behind, and behind the cloud of angels, there with your sharpened eyes, you see the convulsions of the earth. Fire erupts behind Christ as though a thousand volcanoes were erupting at once. There was lightning and smoke, hail and fire, wind and earthquakes. The very elements were melting and nothing and no one left behind was safe. And all around you, you hear a deep and horrifying groan. For the first time, your, your gaze drifts away from the happiness above you, and you hear the cry of those around you to the awesome sight of Jesus. Some of those around you seem to be paralyzed with fear. Many begin to weep with shame and dread, but most seem filled with rage and anger. They flee, they hide, they scream, and they curse. Some have become so furious they appear more as demons than as humans. They spit and they quake. They shake their fists at Christ. But as the Lord draws closer, they all begin to flee and attempt to outrun the judgment of God. They cast themselves to the ground. They gnash their teeth. They plug their ears. However, you are surprised to see those who do not flee. Some were young, some are old. Some you know, some don't. Some you don't know. But all the children, every child of tender age, did not seem to be afraid of Christ. Rather, they too looked up with joy at the approach of Jesus with smiles on their face. Although it took only seconds for Jesus to arrive from the first time you spotted Him on the light to the horizon, it felt like it had been an eternity, but He's no longer far off, far off. The procession has now arrived, and Jesus is directly above you. And in ways you can't fully understand, the eyes of Jesus turn to you personally and look deep into your soul, and you hear His words come to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things, but now I shall make you master over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You feel your body lift up from the ground and begin to ascend closer to the Lord. You must be moving as fast as light, but in that instant, the very twinkling of an eye, you experience an unforgettable transformation of body and, and mind that is incomparable to any experience describable. Like Naaman, your flesh is restored, and as you ascend into the clouds, you draw into your lungs for the very first time a full breath of pure air. And into your new glorified body, you feel such richness and vitality that you almost forget to breathe. There is no poison in this air, no congestion, no pollution, nothing restricts it. Your arms and your legs smooth out. Every joint and muscle is strengthened. Every breath, your, your sense is heightened. Your joy grows fuller. Your hearing is improved. Your vision is improved. Your senses are improved. Your mind is made clear. Your body is awash with light and glowing and newness and vibrancy. You feel all the tenderness and pain of a lifetime of toil fall away to the earth as you rise to meet the Lord in the air. Your body is made Made new. Your heart is strong and filled with love. Your mind is quick and unfettered by disease or disorder. Your very being is renewed into the glorified person Jesus intended for all of His sons and daughters to be. As angels take your hand and lead you to join in the rapture, you see many family and loved ones, parents, relatives, co-workers. You see those who have died before you, you lo your loved ones, your family, your friends. They look totally different as do you as well, but your mind and your perceptions are enhanced so that you see them and you know them. Clasping arms, joining hands, embracing one another, you too join in the song of the Lamb. And then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. And turning now to the great crowd, his voice again fills our ears and lifts our hearts even higher. Jesus speaks to us once more saying, Come, you, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. And so we shall always be 
with the Lord. And then you woke up. Maranatha. Oh, Lord, come. We are Seventh-day Adventists. Are you prepared? Are you proclaiming? Let's pray. Lord, I don't know if it's going to look just like that. But I think it's going to be something close. This was one of your favorite themes in Scripture. From the time of the fall in the garden to the vision to John in the book of Revelation. You have described and taught and revealed what that day will look like. You have been patient with us. You have been gracious with humanity. but this world will not last forever. You are coming again. And if we know anything about prophecy and Scripture, it's coming soon. And I know the church has been saying this for generations, and it may yet be generations before the day actually comes. But Father, we want to be ready regardless. We want to be among those happy and ready when this vision really takes place. Help us, dear Father, to break away from the things of this earth that would entrap us, distract us, obstruct us, even if they're not altogether bad things if they are preventing us from making our relationship with you and our readiness for that new kingdom, Lord, help us to be released from those things. Help us to be ready. And may that day come soon. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for being with us here today. That was a monologue, in case you're wondering, not a sermon. But I hope it gave you something to think about. Have a great Sabbath, and we hope to see you again soon.